Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. In the last video, I took a whole bottle of homeopathic medicine. It's something that's supposed to help you stay awake, and I took it a little before bedtime. You can watch the last couple of minutes of the last video if you want the whole story, but basically, it's my way of showing that homeopathic medicine is baloney. I took the whole bottle, which is 25 doses. That would be a dangerous overdose of almost any real medicine, but I'm happy to say that, as we expected, it didn't do me any harm, and in fact, it didn't even keep me from falling asleep as I usually do. So now, let's get back to talking about some real science. This is the third in a series of three videos talking about the three kinds of chemical reaction. In the previous two videos, we talked about precipitation reactions and then acid-base reactions. Today we'll talk about the third type of reaction, reduction oxidation, or redox reactions. These are really interesting. They include combustion reactions and explosions, and many different kinds of biological reaction, like the ones involved with respiration and photosynthesis. As you can guess from those examples, redox reactions often release large amounts of energy, so they can be really useful when we want to develop new technologies like batteries, fuels, or solar panels. For that reason, we'll talk about redox reactions in several different future chapters in this course and General Chemistry 2, and also in courses you might take in the future, like Physical Chemistry. So what is a redox reaction? Well, remember, redox is short for reduction oxidation. So to understand these reactions, we have to understand what reduction and oxidation are. The key is to think about the charges on the atoms in the compounds that take part in the reaction. For example, here's a reaction in which calcium reacts with silicon dioxide. The products are calcium oxide and silicon. All of those materials are solids, so this isn't a precipitation reaction, and none of them satisfy the definition of acid or base that we talked about in the last video, so this must be the third kind of reaction, a redox reaction. Let's figure out exactly what's going on in this reaction. As usual, the first thing we should do is balance the reaction. The calcium and silicon are balanced right now, so we just need to balance the oxygen. There are two oxygens on the left and one on the right, so we need a coefficient of 2 on the calcium oxide. Now that we've done that, the calcium's not balanced anymore, so we also need a coefficient of 2 on the calcium. And now the reaction is balanced. As I mentioned, in order to understand this reaction, or any redox reaction, the important thing is to know what the charge is on each of the atoms. There are a few simple rules for figuring out charges on the atoms in a molecule. The first rule is that any pure element has a charge of zero. So for example, in a pure piece of copper or iron, the atoms have a charge of zero. That's also true for diatomic elements. So, for example, nitrogen gas is a diatomic element, N2, and the nitrogen atoms, in this case, must have a charge of zero. You might remember that, in a much earlier video, I showed you that there are seven diatomic elements to know about. If you've forgotten them, now would be a good time to review that list. The second rule is that oxygen atoms in a molecule will usually have a charge of minus two. There are definitely exceptions to that rule. For example, the oxygens in hydrogen peroxide actually have a charge of minus 1 instead of minus 2. But we won't need to worry about those exceptions in this course. The third rule is that hydrogen atoms in a molecule will usually have a charge of plus 1. Again, there are a few exceptions, but you won't need to worry about them in this class. The fourth rule is that the charges on the atoms in a neutral molecule should add up to zero. You already actually know about that rule. We've used it many times to figure out the formulas of molecules. For example, the reason magnesium chloride has the formula MgCl2 is because the charges on the atoms must add up to zero. Since magnesium has a charge of plus two and chlorine is minus one, we need two chlorines to make the charges cancel out. The fifth and final rule is that in a polyatomic ion, the charges must add to give the overall charge of the ion. So for example, one of the polyatomic ions you know about is carbonate, 
which has a charge of minus 2. So what are the charges on each atom in this ion? Well, we said a minute ago that oxygen usually has a charge of minus 2. Since there are three of them, that's a total of minus 6 for the oxygens. What about the carbon? Well, rule 5 tells us that the charges on each atom must add up to the overall charge on the ion. In this case, that's minus 2. So that means that the carbon must have a charge of plus 4. So, back to our redox reaction. Let's use the rules we just talked about to find the charge on each atom in the reaction. Rule 1 tells us that any pure element has a charge of 0, so the calcium on the left and the silicon on the right have a charge of 0. Rule 2 tells us that any oxygen in a molecule will have a charge of minus 2, so that takes care of all of our oxygens. Now for the other atoms. Rule 4 tells us that the charges on the atoms in a neutral molecule must total 0. In the case of the silicon dioxide, that means that the silicon must have a charge of plus 4 to counteract the two oxygen atoms. In the case of calcium oxide, the calcium must have a charge of plus 2. And that's it! But notice what happened in this reaction. The oxygen atoms in the reactants had a charge of minus 2, and they still had a charge of minus 2 in the products. But the calcium and silicon had their charges change. The calcium's charge increased from 0 to plus 2, and the silicon went down from plus 4 to 0. Let's think about what happened to those atoms on a really basic level. The charge on the calcium went up. There's only two ways for that to happen. First, we could have gained two protons. But we know that can't be what happened, because if an atom gains protons, it changes what the element actually is. If the calcium had gained two protons, that would have turned it into a titanium atom. That can't be right. The other possibility is that the calcium could have lost two electrons. Since the electrons have a negative charge, losing two of them would cause the charge on the calcium to go up. And that's what happened here. In the case of the silicon, the charge went from positive 4 to 0. The charge went down by 4. Again, since electrons have a negative charge, that means the silicon gained 4 electrons. This is what makes a redox reaction different from a precipitation reaction or an ordinary acid-base reaction. If you look at the precipitation or acid-base reactions we had in the previous two videos, you'll see that the charges on the atoms in those reactions never changed. In a redox reaction, there will always be some elements whose charges change. So in our example, the charge on the silicon went down. We say that the silicon was reduced. Meanwhile, the charge in the calcium increased. That's called oxidation, and that's why these are called reduction-oxidation, or redox reactions. Some people have a hard time remembering the difference between reduction and oxidation, so here's an easy way to keep them straight. Leo the lion says grr. That's Leo, L-E-O, which stands for loses electrons, oxidation. And grr, G-E-R, which stands for gains electrons, reduction. So in our reaction, the calcium lost electrons, so it was oxidized. And the silicon gained electrons, so it was reduced. Let's try another example. As I mentioned earlier, Combustion reactions are redox reactions. Here's the balanced reaction for the combustion of methane. What are the charges on the atoms in this reaction? Well, by rule 1, any pure element has a charge of 0, and that includes diatomic elements. So the oxygens in O2 have a charge of 0. By rule 2, oxygens in a molecule have a charge of minus 2. So the oxygens in the CO2 and in the water have a charge of minus 2. Rule 3 tells us that 
hydrogens in a molecule have a charge of plus one. So the hydrogens in the methane and the water have a charge of plus one. And last, rule four tells us that the charges on atoms in a neutral molecule must add up to zero. So the carbon in CH4 must have a charge of minus four, and the carbon in CO2 must have a charge of plus four. You can see that some of the elements had their charges change, so that makes this a redox reaction. Which element was reduced, and which was oxidized? Well, the carbon went from a charge of minus four to plus four, so that tells us that it lost electrons. If you remember, Leo says ger, you'll know that since it lost electrons, the carbon was oxidized. Meanwhile, the oxygen went from a charge of zero to minus two, so it gained electrons, and that means the oxygen was reduced. Notice that in this example, the oxygen ended up in two different molecules on the product side. That doesn't change anything we just discussed. The important thing is that the charge on the oxygen went down, which is all that matters for deciding whether it was reduced or oxidized. We'll talk much more about redox reactions later in this course, but that's all you need to know about it for now. Now that you know a little about all three of the main types of chemical reaction, there's a lot more chemistry we can do now in future videos, so I'm looking forward to showing you some cool stuff. So until next time, have a good week!